Hello. This presentation is entitled How to Safely Approach and Dissect the Frozen Pelvis. I am Cindy Mossbrooker uh, from Gig Harbor, Washington, founder of Pacific Endometriosis and Pelvic Surgery, a private practice that is dedicated to women with endometriosis. Um, this presentation may better be titled How to Safely Approach and Dissect a Pelvis with Stage 4 Endometriosis. However, frozen pelvis is one of those terms that we use kind of like peak and shriek that everybody knows what it means uh, and nobody wants to do it. Um, unfortunately, there are uh, still doctors in this country and around the world and, and um, not just a few, but quite a lot who take a look at a frozen pelvis and um, are freaked out by lack of a, uh, for lack of a better term, uh, by it because they don't tend to see those kinds of uh, pelvises. They don't see that advanced disease and they don't know how to deal with it and they take a look at it and either they close them up or they try to poke around and free up some adhesions and drain endometriomas and uh, unbeknownst to them actually make things worse. So this presentation is uh, essentially trying to teach you how to approach this, uh, how to start trying to dissect uh, and operate on women with more advanced stage endometriosis and things that you can practice even in uh, not this bad disease. I have no disclosures. Here is a picture of a, uh, what I call a very nice stage four pelvis because it uh, has not been operated on before. But still, this can cause a lot of pain. Uh, our objectives today are to recognize deeply infiltrating endometriosis as well as the fibrosis that goes with it, to understand pelvic retroperitoneal anatomy, to learn how to perform robotic ureterolysis, to understand avascular spaces in the pelvis, and ultimately to be able to turn this picture into this picture. And uh, this is a before and after picture of the same patient. Uh, she was a 32-year-old uh, dentist and uh, really wanted to have a baby. And uh, so she came to see me. Fortunately, she had not had surgery before. And so we were able to save her tubes. And uh, she now has a, a little year and a half old kiddo and uh, is quite happy. And uh, oh, by the way, is feeling better as well. Um, I'm going to move this over here because I think it'll be less in the way. Uh, so it's uh, beyond the scope of this lecture to really teach you anatomy, uh, but we need to uh, talk about some anatomy. And uh, this is an excellent article. It has great pictures of, uh, of, of real surgical uh, pictures. Um, and uh, I think it's worth reading um, if, you, if you can get a hold of it. And here are uh, two pictures from this, from this article. Uh, and uh, this is uh, the left side. Hang on a sec. The left side uh, is on the left. The right side is on the right. Uh, the important things to realize is that uh, the hypogastric trunk lies lateral to the ureter uh, where the uterine, uh, uterine artery gives off. Uh, uh, the continuation of the hypogastric uh, turns into the, uh, eventually to the obliterated uh, umbilical. However, it is definitely not ob obliterated down here. Uh, it gives off the superior vesicle uh, and um, 
and is actually quite vascular uh, all the way on to the anterior abdominal wall. Uh, the paravascal space is the uh, continuation of the lateral pararectal space, which is also called Latsko space. Uh, but the paravascal is distal to where the uterine artery crosses over. And this kind of makes sense because the, the uterine artery comes, coming into the cervix is actually the cardinal ligament. It's a little more obvious on this side where it's a, a little more horizontal. And then the paravascal space uh, is uh, on either side of the bladder, which is uh, uh, distal to the, to the cervix here. Um, the lateral pararectal space is, is not real useful in endometriosis surgery. However, the medial pararectal space, uh, which is just medial to the uterosacral ligament is called Okabayashi space. And that's the, the space that uh, we dissect in all the time to free the rectum up uh, from the disease in the uterosacral. Um, Uh, the other important thing to know, and you don't have to memorize all these branches, uh, but it's that the, the branching of the hypogastric trunk is not always the same. So 80% of the time, uh, the anterior trunk will give off the uterine, uh, and then the superior vesicle, uh, and then continue on to the um, obliterated umbilical artery. Uh, sometimes uh, there is uh, more of a four-way split or a uh, two-way split, um, and it just uh, depends on, uh, on the patient. The blood supply of the ureter is handy to know that in the uh, in the abdomen, it comes medially, but in the pelvis, after the ureter crosses over the iliacs, uh, the vast majority of the, the blood supply is lateral. And so what that means is you want to keep your dissection as much as you can on the medial aspect of the ureter. Um, this is a cross-section of a ureter. Uh, the adventitial layer is fairly loose and uh, it includes the blood vessels that uh, run uh, along the length of the ureter to feed it. Um, the only other uh, pertinent thing is that the, uh, the muscular layer uh, is opposite of the muscular layer of the bowel uh, in that the outer longitudinal layer is circular in the inner uh, muscular layer is uh, longitudinal. Uh, the pelvic nerve plexuses is something that has been talked about uh, quite a bit lately at AAGL and is important. Um, the uh, superior hypogastric plexus in the hypogastric nerves uh, come from, uh, or they uh, condense really along the uh, sacral promontory here, and that's the easiest place to find them. As, as uh, the hypogastric plexus comes down into the pelvis, it kind of uh, spreads out into uh, a number of uh, different nerve endings that go uh, some go along the ureter up into the bladder, some go to the uterus, some go to the rectum. Uh, and then uh, out laterally more, the uh, parasympathetic nerves uh, or the pelvic splanchnics come and uh, run along with some of those more sympathetic nerves from the hypogastric. The important thing to uh, take away from this picture uh, is that the pelvic splanchnics are, uh, tend to be a little uh, deeper in the pelvis um, or, or caudal, and they are also a lot more lateral. Um, if you are interested in uh, learning about um, pelvic nerves, 
I would strongly recommend that you go to the pelvic neuroanatomy course in St. Louis. It is an excellent course. Dr. Lemos um, is, um, is uh, I call him uh, Dr. Passover Jr. Uh, he, is, he is probably the um, best expert in North America at pelvic neuroanatomy. And uh, it's a very worthwhile uh, week to spend uh, dissecting out these nerves in the pelvis. Um, so our first video today is, uh, is our dentist. Um, and fortunately, this is a uh, pelvis that has not been operated on yet. Uh, and that makes life a whole heck of a lot easier because the fallopian tubes tend not to be as damaged. Um, and the ovaries tend to have more normal surfaces uh, on the surface, um, which is helpful. So, I also wanted to say, if I can find the control of this, I guess I can't. Um, so a lot of other lectures from AAGL have been little short video clips um, from one procedure or another. And this is basically one long surgery condensed into a, about a 10 minute video. And so what I'm doing here is I'm, uh, I'm trying to restore the sidewall and uh, um, find the medial leaf of the broad ligament and initially stay on top of it as I dissect the bowel wall off. Uh, that way I know uh, better where I am. I'm now entering the retroperitoneal space and we'll find the ureter uh, and it's actually uh, right over here. Um, sometimes it can be attached to the bow wall and it can be pulled way more medial than what you expect. Um, so there's superficial endometriosis on the, uh, on the peritoneum over the IP ligament. So I'm trying to get that off. Uh, you can see the tube, her tubes look really good, uh, which is good for her. Ureter again is, is right behind my bipolar. And the easiest way to dissect the ureter is to, to use your bipolar as a shield uh, to protect it um, and basically lateralize the ureter and then dissect on the medial side of it. With the uh, endometrioma opened up, um, I'm uh, not gonna dissect that out yet. I'm gonna make sure that the lateral disease is gone so that once I close the ovary um, and suspend it to the round ligament, then um, I'm not gonna hide any disease out here laterally. So, and in, in, you can dissect uh, endometriosis off of the serosa of the tube safely and leave a functional tube. So now we've got uh, the, ovary separated from the sidewall, we're freeing it from the ureter here. And then um, there's also additional fibrosis underneath the ovary that is kind of holding it tight down to the sidewall. And we wanna make sure to get all that stuff out. Um, here is the hypogastric with the uh, obliterated umbilical and the uterine artery coming this way. Um, we wanna make sure that the um, um, that we can find the uh, uterine so that we can also free the disease uh, from the uh, uterine artery as well as from the ureter. Um, if you don't get this fibrosis out, uh, first of all, it's hard to know how much endometriosis is within this fibrotic tissue. Uh, likely there is some. Um, and uh, even if there's not any, uh, the fibrosis predisposes to um, pretty significant adhesions. And so I like to make sure that uh, uh, I resect all of that stuff that's, that's not totally normal uh, because it just, it looks ratty. 
uh, it's not aesthetically pleasing. And, uh, um, and I fear that it will predispose to uh, more adhesions. Uh, here you can see the, the beautiful plane uh, between the cyst wall uh, and the ovary. And uh, if you're fortunate uh, enough to operate on somebody who hasn't had surgery before, this is how this plane should look. Um, it tells you that you're in the right space when there's not a ton of bleeding and that you're really only taking out the disease and that you're uh, leaving as much normal ovary as you possibly can. And that's the goal for these young women who, uh, who uh, want to preserve their fertility. So I close the ovaries uh, and I also uh, loosely suspend them to the round ligament. I know everybody doesn't do this, uh, but I find it helpful in preventing adhesions uh, in the future. Um, you will see a patient who uh, had their own endometrioma drained in the next uh, video, and the tube is trapped underneath the ovary. Uh, it also uh, allows you to suture the uterovarian vessels that might be bleeding, like I just did, uh, and then close the raw surfaces so that the ovary has as much normal shiny surface, which is less likely to form adhesions. These last couple of stitches through the, the uh, round um, or pretty much just to keep it out of the way while I'm operating. Here you can see on the right side, uh, a similar uh, presentation. Um, and uh, ureter is here. Uh, and there is clearly a lot of endometriosis here that is uh, overlying the ureter. Uh, uterosacral ligament is completely obliterated. It's hard to tell where it is. Uh, this fat tells me that I'm medial to the uterosacral and uh, on, the, on the bowel wall and basically in Okabayashi space. Uh, so now I can resect all this uh, fibrotic stuff that is uh, essentially on the uterosacral and in the uterosacral. Um, and then that will help me uh, free the ovary up uh, from the sidewall and uh, separate the ureter from the disease. Um, this over here is uh, uterosacral, uh, which almost always has uh, some of the deepest disease in the pelvis. Uh, here's another little baby endometrioma on the surface of the ovary. And so we wanna get that guy out of there. Um, and then again, we're um, circumscribing uh, the opening of the endometrioma uh, in order to remove the uh, fibrosis and the endo on the surface. Um, sometimes you have to use a little bit of um, monopolar cautery to get the cyst wall out, uh, but the less you use, the, the better. And now uh, we're gonna separate the ovary from, uh, from the re remaining disease in the sidewall. Uh, excise the lateral endo, which um, this was uh, an adhesion with endometriosis underneath it on the round. Uh, it's hard to see when the uterus is stuck with uh, both endometriomas. Now that we get that free, um, we can get this dissected out of there. A lot of times you'll see endometriosis on the edge of the uh, anterior uterus that actually goes down into the bladder. So we, we wanna inspect the bladder and, and make sure that this isn't within the detrusor muscle itself. A lot of times uh, disease in this area will uh, communicate from the, uh, from the front to the back, so to speak, uh, and having the ureter partly dissected uh, is quite helpful. Uh, 
Uh, sometimes you'll need to dissect out the ureter from both sides. Um, and uh, in those cases, then you'll, you'll pretty much do a ureter lysis all the way down to the bladder itself. Um, now we're sewing up the ovary and closing the ovary. And again, um, these vessels along the uterovarian ligament uh, and just under the ovary uh, frequently will bleed quite a bit. And uh, uh, in these young gals who want to conceive, I, I prefer to suture them rather than use cautery. So here's ureter, uh, uterine artery somewhere over here. Uh, and uh, this is all fibrotic disease uh, that needs to come out. Um, so what I want to do is I want to find her uterine artery. So here I'm starting to see things that, uh, that look like uh, the hypogastric and the uterine. Uh, And again, looking at some of this tissue, it, it doesn't have the classic appearance of what people are taught is endometriosis, but it, it looks unhappy, it looks fibrotic, it looks like old scar. And uh, that tends to mean that uh, there's probably endometriosis within that. So now you can see on this sidewall, uh, ureter and uh, uterine artery over here. Uh, and then this is uterus sacral ligament. And now we're dissecting medial to the uterus sacral to try to uh, find Okabayashi space. This should be a relatively bloodless space. Uh, however, sometimes you can get just in the wrong tissue plane and have quite a bit of bleeding. Uh, so if that happens, um, I usually just go to the other side. Here again, uh, uterosacral is lateral. And... Um, If we are medial to the uterus sacral, then we can feel fairly uh, uh, fairly, fairly good that the uh, hypogastrics are lateral to the uterus sacral. Um, now we're dissecting this large mass of endometriosis in the rectovaginal septum off of the back of the cervix. Trying to stay medial to the uterine vessels but trying to get deep to the disease. And again, here's Okabayashi space. And uh, we can try to get as distal as we can uh, and actually get down into the rectovaginal septum. So here are some of the fibers of the hypogastric nerve. Um, and again, on this side, they're mostly over here. Uh, however, there are some fibers that, uh, that look like they might be a little more medial, so uh, we can take our dissection a little more medial. When we see this nice white shiny tissue, then that tells us we're in the right plane. We're deep enough uh, that we're around the endometriosis. Um, and uh, this video continues on the uh, rectovaginal endometriosis uh, presentation. Um, so this gal uh, had a bowel resection um, and about a year later was able to conceive. So uh, in case you're wondering, uh, excision surgery for women with stage four endometriosis is fertility preserving. Uh, many different studies show somewhere between a 55 and a 60% conception rate and uh, pregnancy rate. 
uh, for women with stage four endo who have had uh, excision surgery. This is a patient who um, has had prior surgery and you can see how damaged her fallopian tube is. Um, we're, we're getting the attachment of the sigmoid off of the sidewall and this is a, a common theme. Uh, once you start doing this kind of surgery, you will recognize that most of these patients have a variation on a theme on uh, in, in how their disease presents. Um, lateralizing the, the ureter, um, this bowel fat is uh, presumably medial to the uh, uterosacral ligament. Uh, this gal is having a hysterectomy, so fortunately I don't have to try to save this fallopian tube and, and reconstruct it. Uh, sometimes when the, when the fimbria look like this, you can save it. Um, it's, it's only when the tubes are super distended and, and dilated with blood that I, that I usually will remove them. Now here, uh, ureter is underneath this fibrotic stuff. And, uh, you can see this fibrotic scar here, uh, attaching itself to the ovary. And so we actually have to get into the, uh, to the inner layer uh, around the ureter. And this isn't really the adventitia, uh, but there does tend to be an extra layer of tissue um, that you have to get into in order to resect uh, this um, fibrotic stuff uh, and potentially disease. Um, from the ureter. And if you don't get deep enough to the ureter itself, uh, then you'll think you, you can't get it out. Um, so that's important. Here's the uh, uterine artery over here, uh, which will be coming up and crossing over the ureter. Um, We're taking down the anterior leaf of the broad ligament, and you can see how much scar and, and nasty, junky stuff she's got here. Uh, and so I decided to take the bladder down uh, so that I can see where her uterine is. And uh, I happened to find the ureter, which is right here. And a lot of times the ureter will be a lot more medial and a lot higher on the vagina than you expect to find. And so in these patients with a lot of disease in their cardinal ligaments uh, and in the parametrium, um, it is necessary to um, divide the uterine vessels or specifically the uterine artery lateral to the ureter. Uh, in order to take the vessels down and, and preserve the ureter. So uh, this is technically a radical hysterectomy, but you can't bill it that way without a cancer diagnosis, uh, which is unfortunate. So I always uh, uh, ligate the stump of the uterine with the endo loop. Uh, it helps me sleep better at night. Uh, I don't trust my cautery, uh, but I do trust a, an endo loop much better. Now we can grab the, uh, the distal aspect of the uterus, or excuse me, the uterine, and pull that medially, and then that helps us get the ureter dissected uh, away from the fibrotic disease in the cardinal ligament and uh, right next to the cervix. Uh, so that we can um, get the cervix removed safely. Finally, um, this is a, uh, a trick that I learned recently, um, and that is to inject ICG into the ureters. 
I take an open-ended uh, catheter, also known as a Pollock catheter, inject it, uh, insert about 10 cc or 10 centimeters up into the ureter, and then inject five cc's on each side. And what this does is it actually dyes the ureter. So when you're doing a challenging case and you don't know where the ureter is, uh, you can turn on Firefly. And uh, as long as the tissue is thin enough, uh, you'll be able to see it. And so this is, uh, this is really quite helpful um, because you don't have to necessarily keep, um, keep dissecting out the ureter if you can tell that it's going deep to where you're at uh, and where you need to get to. So in, in this instance, uh, this gal had a big endometrioma uh, and we dissected the endometrioma away from the ureter. And before I freed up the ovary from the sidewall, I wanted to see where the ureter is. And fortunately it's well below where the ovary, uh, where I need to do my dissection. Um, so that I think will save you some time. Uh, here are my references. And here's my contact information. So feel free uh, to email me uh, or text me if you want to uh, uh, know anything further, or if you'd like to come visit and learn how to do ultrasounds or uh, anything else. So thank you very much. Thank you to AAGL for uh, allowing me to present today. And uh, I hope you have a great virtual Congress. Thank you.